Ναι, στη Λευκοσία. Ωραία, ξεκινήσαμε. Well, good, uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon to uh, everybody, depending where, where you are uh, in the planet at this time. Uh, we're continuing on. This is our day four of the uh, uh, Georgie Dennis uh, Eastern Mediterranean Security and Diplomacy Seminar. This is our third annual seminar. Uh, and this is in collaboration with a number of partners uh, here in the United States and in Greece, you know, with... Uh, the Karaman Lis chair at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, as well as Edis in, in Athens and the American College of uh, Greece. Uh, and we're bringing together this uh, number of um, 16 in, in number of presentations to sort of like uh, view the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and, and the importance of, of the region from different perspectives, so all sides of the, of the Mediterranean. And in this uh, seminar this week, we have been sort of like focusing on the idea of research and, and nationalism as an idea. And we put it in quotations at the beginning of the week as Professor Milonas Uh, who presented the very first uh, presentation said, you know, maybe we ought to put it in quotations because maybe nationalism has always been there and it's sort of like recurrent rather than research and so on and so forth. So which has really fostered a great deal of discussion uh, and continued on on Tuesday and Wednesday when we looked at more regional issues, you know, from the conundrum of, of the Cypriot situation to the Libyan situation yesterday afternoon. And of course, looking at areas like the Uh, the Balkans uh, yesterday and this morning we had uh, Ambassador Ram Aviram uh, discuss the whole idea between the balancing act between interests and values. And uh, we turn our attention to well, somebody that has participated uh, in the seminar in the past and we're very, very grateful to have him uh, back with us. And although he's a, 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 a terrific energy expert in the region and an expert of the region in so many different ways, uh, Dr. Theodore Tsekiris, who's at the University of Nicosia, uh, today will give us a, a something different, you know, and we're eagerly waiting his, his analysis. Uh, and then we'll continue on with our Q&A as we have uh, in, in, in previous presentations for some of you who have uh, participated. So, Turn on your turn off your microphones. Let's listen to uh, Mr. Chakiris, and then turn on your uh, brains and uh, raise all kinds of questions for a uh, hopefully a, a very lively discussion. That the topic uh, today is the sources of Turkish conduct, uh, the ideological origins of Turkish revisionism, and Greece's containment strategies. So, Mr. Chakiris, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming once again, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Vamakas. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Well, um, to try to, to, to present something which would be more in tune with the general thesis, the general framework of, the, uh, of this uh, series of this seminar, in the sense to note that, as was also mentioned by uh, Professor Vamakas regarding the, the thesis of a previous speaker, that nationalism never left the region. Nationalism Uh, was always been here and it has been resurgent. And that's a very interesting uh, point of view from the strategic analysis of, of Greece and Cyprus with regards to Turkish behavior, because, you know, uh, for, for all, even ever since the, um, then the beginning of the Cyprus question in 1955, we've always experienced both in Greece and in Cyprus, the concept of Turkish nationalism. But that was a very, very different concept of nationalism than the one that is actually being um, uh, instrumentalized uh, and is actually being uh, used uh, as a means of, of Turkish revisionism and Turkish expansion under the Erdogan presidency. And that is very interesting to, to try to understand because there are the dif these different identities, these different uh, ideological constructions of Turkish nationalism have very different geopolitical um, perspectives Uh, if you compare them. And they have very different geopolitical agendas as well with regards to the boundaries of the claims, with regards to the preferred areas of concentration with, or, or when it comes to, to Turkish regional role and Turkish regional uh, uh, revisionism uh, that uh, are quite interesting. And it is impossible to understand them and analyze them unless you deep dive into the ideology, what would con what constitute the ideological identity of Erdogan's uh, revolution. And it's very important to see, I have an article coming up in the Greek Foreign Affairs 
uh, on that particular issue, which is the ideological origins of Erdoganism, not just Erdogan, because Erdogan has been ruling Turkey for more than a generation. Okay, if he's re-elected in 2023, or whenever the elections are, are held in, in Turkey, uh, he would be running uh, Turkey for more than 25 years, more than an entire generation. And, and no other party other than the, C the CHP, which is the Kemal, uh, the Cumhuriyet the Halk Party, the Kemalist party, the Kemalist tradition, has been identified with a regime in Turkey, as has been the case of the AKP under, uh, under Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I'm saying that because it's very important to understand the ideological components of, of Erdogan's Weltanschauung or the, his, what the Germans would call his perception about the world, which are very important in terms of, of us being informative of what formulated his foreign policy. And the reason why Erdogan has taken steps, especially after 2016, when he completely eliminated most of his internal opposition as a result of the coup of 2016, the referendum of 2017, which created the so-called imperial presidency in Turkey that concentrates all executive power and emaciates the power both of the, both of the legislature, legislature as well as the judiciary component of the Turkish political system by concentrating powers at the hands of the presidency, which he took in 2018 and he is reclaiming in 2023. It's very important to make this distinction because these two different types of between Kemalism and Erdoganism, which is essentially Turkish political Islam, which Turkish Islamism essentially, have very, very different perceptions with regard to the geopolitical origins and the geopolitical directions of the country itself. And I'm referring to that because we need to see Erdogan not just as the ruler of a party or a ruler of a government or a ruler of a regime, because it's eventually it's been a regime essentially since the, the, the neutralization of the interventionist parts of the Turkish military and the Turkish judiciary in the political process, which starts in 20, 2010 with the uh, showcases of the Ergenegon and Berlioz cases that uh, culminates through the coup of 2016, through a, 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 a basically um, a top down um, removal of tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of public, uh, public servants, judges, diplomats, military personnel from different positions that follow the 2016 uh, coup and continued to the present day until 2022 at least, because it's important to understand Erdogan for what he really is. Erdogan is a political Islamist. Erdogan is not just a Turkish nationalist. He is the leader of an Islamic party, which for the lack of better word, as it has been described by many leading Arabologists and Islamologists, including Gilles Kepel, which is a famous uh, teacher in Sciences Po in France that has dealt with political Islamism, including the Turkish phenomenon throughout the Middle East, AKP and Erdogan is the offshot of the Turkish Muslim Brotherhood. And that is very important to understand, not only with regards to the way that he has seen himself evolving through the, Tur the changes within the Turkish political system, but because, you know, the, the Turkish Islam, okay, and the way that it combines its own political ideology with Turkish nationalism. So we have basically in the form of, of Erbakan's and the successive Turkish Islamist parties, but also more importantly through the writings of Recep Fazil Kizakurek, who is the, uh, as Erdogan himself said, his ideological idol with regards to uh, who systematized, he's a 1940s, essentially, he wrote most of his work in the 1940s, 1950s, and he became one of the first uh, critics, the first polemics of the Kemalist revolution after Inonu. And uh, he fought against it on the principle that it was a secular revolution, a revolution that basically uprooted the Islamic traditions of the Ottoman Empire, but at the same time, it, it perceived Turkish nationalism in very, not as an opposing factor to Islamism, but as basically a synthesis between the Islamic traditions, the Muslim traditions of Sunni Islam and the Caliphate 
that uh, Kemal destroys in 1923 on the one side, with the very the more important concept of Turkish nationalism, which may include even pre-Islamic characteristics. It's very important to note that Kizakurek is considered to be the, the leading ideologist of none other than the MHP party, the party of the Grey Wolves, what we call ultra-nationalists in Turkey, but uh, and ultra-nationalists who perceive Turkishness uh, even though they they find the roots of Turkish and even pre-Islamic Turkish culture, they are closely identify with Islam and see a Turkish Islamic synthesis as the concept not only of their ideology in a way that how they perceive Turkey, but also in in the sense of basically uh, a polemical uh, reaction uh, and an uncompromising fight to overthrow the basic characteristics of Kemalist. Ataturk of, Kem of Kemalism and Ataturk's re secular revolution of Turkey. And this is something which has been happening in Turkey systematically since at least after 2011, both in the concept of its foreign policy, because it's after that point that Erdogan decides to have a much more expansive, much more interventionist role with regards to Turkey's role in the Middle East, by instrumentalizing AKP's very close relationship, not only ideological, but practical political relationship with different Islamic political parties that are associated or identified with the Muslim Brotherhood parties in Syria, in Libya, and first and foremost in Egypt itself after the fall of Mubarak in 2011. But more importantly, after 2011, and, and as Turkey has become more and more entrenched in the geopolitics of the Middle East, which for those who remember Kemalism and the principles of Kemalism, intervention in the Middle East was basically a taboo for Kemalist foreign policy and for the custodians of Kemalist foreign policy in Turkey, which was the military. After 2016, essentially, when basically the, the, the last remnants of Kemalist resistance to the onslaught of Erdoganism as, as a basically as a, as a political revolutionary Islamist party. And I underst underline the word revolutionary because the revolution that Erdogan undertook was very, very effective in with regards to Turkish society and with regards to the Turkish polity and the Turkish constitution. Uh, in for, for one simple reason, it did not happen through a revolution as it happened in the form of Iran, or, that, or, or as many uh, of the original Muslim Brotherhood leaders of Egypt, Hassan al-Banna or uh, Said could would have perceived or have imagined. It happened very slowly. It happened very systematically. It happened through the process of takia, which is basically uh, a, a, a religiously justified form of uh, of um, uh, masquerading your true objectives uh, before you have, in order to fool your opponent. For example, takiye was uh, a, a behavior that was observed between different, uh, between different, between different uh, um, participants of the of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which were seen uh, womanizing or consuming alcohol or making different types of, of sin of haram, as it's called in, in Islam, uh, that was justified in order to fool the opponent. And basically, Erdogan's domestic political takiye tactics of fooling the opponent and of slowly but steadily emaciating and weakening his force has been exemplary. And it's basically a copy paste of how, if you read Said Qutb's uh, uh, books uh, on how this should be done uh, against a secular government, this is exactly basically how Erdogan performed his own uh, revolution. It took him much more time. Uh, it was relatively non-violent, okay, very non-violent, but it has been very effective so far. When it comes to, to foreign policy, even though Kemalist nationalism has been very aggressive with regards to Turks, with regards to Greeks, and with regards to the revision of the of the Lausanne Treaty internally, which which took the form of of uh, violating the rights that Lausanne was supposed to protect of the Greek 
ethnic minorities of Imbros, Tenedos, and Constantinople, as well as other lesser cases of, of infringement uh, of the Lausanne Treaty. When it came, when it came to discussing the possibility of foreign policy applications of the treaty, there was a very significant distinction. There was a very significant difference between what the critics of Kemal demanded of Turkish foreign policy and what Kemal himself and his, uh, his successors in, uh, followed as an example of foreign policy. Kemal has been hailed as the secular reformer, not just of Turkey, of the entire Middle East, who uh, embedded Turkey into a transatlantic institutions through Turkey's joining of NATO and through a, 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 a successive process of relative democratization, which of course was a democratization that was under the provision that all different parties would acknowledge the special role of the military to intervene in the political process. And the military of Turkey helped by the judiciary and other elements of the Turkish bureaucracy was never timid in exercising what he perceived to be uh, Kemal's order as uh, the protectors of the Kemalists and the secular revolution, which was essentially basically military interventions in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and of course in the 1990s, which in 1997, there was a pronunciamento that, that led to the fall of the first Islamic, Islamist prime minister of the Erbakan party to which um, Erba Erdogan was, was a member of in 1997, which threw, among others, Erdogan himself to jail and, 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 and forced him, uh, not forced him, uh, removed him from the office of the mayor of Constantinople of Istanbul, which was elected, where he was elected with the AKP flag and the AKP ticket in 1994. This is what happened in 1997, 1998. So, uh, from a foreign policy agenda, uh, the Turkish Islamists, of which Erdogan is a, a, the leading figure, always had as a geopolitical um, objective against Kemalism and as a political, as a geopolitical, not objective, as a geopolitical um, form of accusation against Kemalism, three, three major accusations, three major points of, of, of critique. The first one was that Kemal's domestic revolution that uprooted through the destruction of the Sultanate, but more importantly, the Caliphate, the Islamic identity of Turkey, and therefore try to uh, remove it from its Ottoman past and from its Ottoman glory as it's perceived by the Turkish uh, Islamists, was basically uh, uh, not only a secular revolution that was imposed by the West and more importantly by uh, a, 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 an assortment of, of, of conspiratorial understanding of Masons and, and Jews as Erbakan and as his accurate write in their own books, uh, the last one being published by Erbakan's Davan in 2013, two years after his death. And I'm referring to Erbakan because the first Islamist prime minister, I'm not saying that Erbakan and, and Erdogan are the same, but they are of the same root. They are of the same family, and Erdogan has even been more uh, has more importantly Erdogan has even been more influenced by Kisakurex writing on Turkish Islam Turkish Islamic nationalism uh, than Erbakan himself. So the first accusation was that basically Kemal did what he did because he was a puppet of the West, and because all the the Kemalists which followed on his path, especially the ones. That, the one that brought Turkey into NATO and wanted to bring Turkey to the European Union was essentially what collaborationists of the West that were ready to receive Western support in order to keep their power and keep suppressing the great mass of the Turkish people who wanted to overthrow Kemalism, who were basically conservative Muslims that identify that were the that stood in the exact opposite direction of where Kemal wanted to take his country. And that is very important because also goes back to the to, to Erdogan's own perception that essentially uh, that the coup of 2016 was another Western-led conspiracy which was orchestrated by the United States and by its allies. And that's not just a theory, it's it's part of the public uh, the public uh, record of what Erdogan what Soylu, what members, leading members of AKP and, 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 and Erdogan's government have been saying since 2016, and the refusal of the United States to hand over a sacrificial lamp uh, 
um, um, the Gulen is a proof in their eyes of, of the West's culpability and the West's um, um, the West's conspiratorial attempt to overthrow him. And he claims, they claim that Turkish Islamists, I mean, that all the different coups that happened in Turkey were happened at the behest of the United States and through the full support of the United States uh, as the leading Western Cold War power in that sense. So basically the US and Europe opposed the rise of, West, of, of democracy in Turkey because that democracy was identified with the rise of political Islam and that which was personified in the form of Erdogan. That's the first, the first understanding, the first, the first form of accusation. The second form of accusation was that in order to keep his revolution within Turkey and his own position with Turkey, Erdogan, Kemal and his successors were pliant, were compliant with the West, and that uh, led them to sacrifice the Mili Gyorush, uh, uh, sorry, the Mili Gyoru, the Misak Mili, Misak Omili doctrine, which is basically the decision of the Turks of the first Turkish National Assembly to deny the Treaty of Severs, which dismembered the, the Ottoman Empire in 1920, but also which uh, that was supposed to end with the Lausanne Treaty of 1923. But basically, what is the birth? The, the birth certificate document of the Turkish Republic, which is the Lausanne Treaty, which is a sense, a source of pride for Turkish nationalists under Kemal, okay, under Kemal, and was considered to be basically the founding document of his own revolution, the, the, the birth document, the birth certificate of modern Turkey for Turkish Islamists is a disgusting document that has been a, a proof that the Turkey has been too lenient vis-a-vis -vis Greece. Okay, and vis-a-vis -vis the other countries, because the Mil Mil Misak Mili uh, document, Misak Mili map, which basically uh, describes Turkish revisionism uh, and Turkish opposition to the uh, imp 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 imposition of the Serbs Treaty in the areas of the former Ottoman Empire, did not only claim the Aegean islands and Western Thrace from Greece, also Cyprus from what was then the British, uh, a British crown colony, which event, a British uh, protectorate, excuse me, in 1922-1923, but it also had specific um, territorial, uh, uh, specific territorial claims against other countries in the region, including primarily focused on the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Greece, Bulgaria, and all the other air countries around uh, around the present day borders of Turkey, which were basically should have been part of the Treaty of Lausanne. And Erdogan in 2016, famously within Chankaya, the, the presidential palace, says when he's referring to Inonu and to Kemalists, uh, he goes on a public diatribe against them and accuses them a little bit of being treacherous to the 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 the, uh, basically the, the geopolitical aspirations of the Misak Mili, the oath of the nation, as it's called, geopolitical agenda, by saying the people who, and I quote, the people who dealt with the um, negotiation in Lausanne, and basically that's Inonu, the second president of Turkey after uh, Ataturk, uh, made, a, uh, made a terrible job out of it, look at those islands, look how close they are to our coastline. If we shout, they are going to hear us. Do you think that this is a success? This takes place in October 2016. And that is essentially the defining moment uh, with regards to, to Erdogan's own foreign policy from that point over, which is basically identified, and this is the, the impact in terms of, of foreign policy, which is basically identified, identifies his foreign policy priorities within the concept of Misak, uh, Misak Mili, of the oath of the nation. And that's very important to note because even though between 20, 2011 and 2016, Turkey had begun to claim specific areas of the Eastern Mediterranean around Turkey and between around Cyprus, excuse me, in between Cyprus and 
a very large portion of the Eastern Mediterranean that ended somewhere around Castellorizo with regards to the clay, Turkish claims of what was the Turkish continental shelf in the region. After 2016, Erdogan's decision to change the status quo of the Lausanne Treaty becomes foreign policy directive number one. And that foreign policy directive number one takes the former specific actions on the ground, which are not justified by basically a simple geopolitical understanding of, of, uh, of balance of power. And it cannot be explained through basically economic analysis of, of trying to find more natural gas reserves or energy reserves for Turkey, I mean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, because that was the focus the, the greater area of the Eastern Mediterranean was the focus of, of Erdogan's attention and of, Erd of the expansion of, of Erdogan's you know, pool after 2016, including, of course, Syria. But because it follows a very clear and a very systematic message that exists in the writings of all Turkish Islamists who consider the Lausanne Treaty a defeat for Turkish nationalism and consider the Lausanne Treaty the result of Kemal's subjugation to the West, uh, who forced him to impose his Kemalist secular revolution that turned the Turkish nation against its own identity. And here I'm paraphrasing one of the basic messages of, of Davutoglu's own strategic depth uh, analysis and of his own uh, uh, critiques against Kemalism as prime minister of Turkey in 2010. 2020, 2011, I can give you, if you'd like, the specific citations of that through the works of, of different um, analysis. So what happens and what explains the expansion of Turkish behavior and expansion of Turkish revisionism, which goes on high speed after 2016, after Erdogan feels that he's secure enough within Turkey not to be overthrown by the military, not to be taken to court by the judicial system, not to be questioned effectively by parliament after 2016 and between 2016 and until he undertakes the, the oath of president and the powers of the presidency in Turkey, uh, he's, he's ruling by diktats essentially, something uh, because the country was, was, was declared in a condition of emergency, something that he can do again now because of the earthquakes thereby potentially delaying the elections again until the, the, the moment is, is, is right for, uh, for him to win. And that's the general biggest discussion. But what happens after 2016 is that you see three military interventions in Syria, which leads to occupations of four Syrian provinces along the north and the northwest or the northeast of, of the Syrian area. You see a multiplication of Turkish incursions and the establishment of many Turkish sovereign bases, as Turkey calls them, in northern Iraq. We are seeing an expansion of Turkish military presence in uh, Somalia, in Doha in 2016, where the base started to build. In, of course, the attempt in 2018 to acquire a base in Sudan, a naval military base in Sudan. And more importantly, where basically you see the, the, you see the full deployment of the Mavi Vatan concept by which started by a group of, 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 of naval theorists, but is fully and then passed on to the Mehepe ideology and then passed on as government policy under AKP after 2016-2017. You see in 2017 in through from Athens, December 2017 in Athens, Erdogan calling from the revision of the Lausanne Treaty and goes into a public uh, you know, heated exchange of opinions with the president of the Greek Republic and the then prime minister, uh, Mr. Tsipras and Mr. Pavlopoulos. And more importantly, what basically is the, the high point of that whole expansive idea, which falls within, nevertheless, the concept of, of Turkey as a, as a regional power, as a regional hegemon through territorial expansion and through an association of alliances with Muslim Brotherhood parties throughout the Middle East, even though that policy failed in Syria, it has occupied very large components of northern Syria, even though that policy failed in the case of of, uh, of Egypt, it has still, it's still protecting the, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey and is using it as a leverage against uh, uh, the, the secular regime, the secular nationalist regime in Egypt. 
And even though it failed in Syria and Egypt, it has worked partially in the case of Libya and through the attempted, uh, basically, satellization the 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 turning the, the the Turkish military intervention essentially in the Libyan civil war after November 2019, but has been accompanied, of course, by the the, the so-called um, MOU about the delimitation of the of the maritime zones uh, EEZ between Turkey and a country with which doesn't have uh, borders, which is Libya, especially. Uh, Eastern Libya, between basically Turkey and the government of Tripoli, which Turkey kept alive throughout, through massive, uh, basically, uh, military aid in terms of drones, in terms of munitions, in terms of, of, of Syrian jihadists and other uh, interesting uh, forces of, of, of basically power projection on the cheap, because this is, this is exactly what happened. Since 2000, of course, and of course that, that culminated in the summer of 2020 by the, another uh, showdown with Greece, which was the most dangerous uh, uh, era of Greek-Turkish relations since the EMEA crisis of 1996. That led in, in, in 2020 to the, uh, basically to illegal uh, seismic uh, attempted by the Turkish um, vessels that belonged to the Turkish state, the Turkish state oil company TPAO, uh, throughout the areas of the Eastern Mediterranean that uh, are claimed as part of Greece's, and of course, and that's a very significant uh, issue, of undeclared um, and unspecified continental shelf to the area which lies to the east of the part of the Eastern Mediterranean that has now been demarcated by uh, the Greek Egyptian EZ of July, uh, of July, uh, of August, actually, of July, uh, which was signed in August, of August 2020, which is the only EZ agreement that Greece has in the Eastern Mediterranean that over, uh, overlaps with areas that are claimed by Turkey as part of a continental shelf within the MOU. So basically, the what changes Turkish Islamic nationalism with regards to Kemalist nationalism is a much stronger will to engage in the Middle East uh, and basically play the card of, of the Islamic Brotherhood Party's association with Turkey as a leverage of his foreign policy, something that Kemalists would shy away from. It is much more violently aggressive and expansionist on the ground uh, with regards to Syria, with regards partially to Iraq, and more, and of course, with regards to Greece, because it is under a, a Turkish Islamist government, and a government between the Turkish Islamist Party and or the Turkish Islamist parties, plural, of AKP and MHP, where Turkey is claiming now uh, dozens of, of inhabited islands of Greece and is pushing forward the novel theory that the, the island, that the, the Greek islands that were recognized as a Greek already since 1913 and since 1920 and fully established in 1923, fully recognized in 1923 and in 1947, uh, which are militarized by Greece, uh, uh, the militarization of these islands by Greece leads to the uh, questioning on the part of Turkey of whether these islands, and I'm talking about all the islands of the Eastern Mediterranean, nearly all the islands of the Eastern Aegean now should belong to Greece. So basically we have a situation where the, the Turkish uh, claims against now um, uh, Turkey and against Greek sovereignty over all the islands of the Eastern of the Eastern Aegean and many smaller islands, a lot of them inhabited throughout Aegean, even to the south of Crete, are questioned and are challenged by, by Turkish revisionism that has the very distinct characteristics of a Turkish Islamic synthesis that has been operationalized by Erdogan in the Middle East through his association with the Muslim Brotherhoods against Syria, against Egypt, and against Israel, but to different degrees of, of threat and to different degrees of persistence, of course, and has taken the form of direct military intervention or direct military threats against Iraq, Syria, obviously, Cyprus, Greece, and all the way to Libya between 2016 and 2020. Since 2020, there has been a detente, which is primarily another diplomatic taki on the part of Erdogan in order to be able to get the F-16s instead of the F-35s that he lost, 
And that's a big battle for him because the Greek rearmament is shifting the balance of power in the region. And basically, that is the, the, the only strategy, the alternative between uh, the, the, the containment strategies of Greece were basically maybe some mistitles, not an alternative. The only strategy for Greece with regards to Turkey is containment and deterrence. And that does not exclude the possibility of dialogue, obviously, but this will not force a dialogue on, on Turkish terms that is going to try, is going to, try to, to, to change into bilateral differences, unilateral claims, which are becoming more and more aggressive and are becoming more and more intrusive and, and, and um, uh, are taking a more and more aggressive stand to the point of imposing a situation of geopolitical asphyxiation of Greece within just the territorial waters of its island, including uh, uh, Rhodes and, and Crete. I've taken more than your time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Vakas, for the, for the introduction and for the participation. I'd be more than happy to stay uh, uh, for any Q&As that you have. Uh, yeah, well, thank, thank, minutes. thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chekiris, for a very uh, thorough uh, presentation, not only uh, uh, your geopolitical analysis, and but, you know, the, even the I think of, of, of great interest is sort of like the genesis of um, this uh, Turkish uh, uh, neo-nationalism, if you if you wish, or the the changing nationalism over over time, um, and how that's you know creating uh, you know the a sense of even revisionism in 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 Turkey, and I think there are a lot of you know it prompts me with a, a number of a, a number of questions. Uh, um, as far as you know, the, where Turkey is going and this revisionism, which seems to be at this particular point, especially vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the northern part of Turkey, like in the Black Sea area and beyond, where this revisionism is at uh, is on the ground right now. This is the the big confrontation, of course. You know that tomorrow is closing like to a year of like you know Russia trying to you know do exactly the same thing, like you know. Uh, build off its national aspirations or its own sort of like nationalist narrative uh, and playing its cards on the ground right now. So to what extent do you assess what uh, Russia is doing uh, is sort of like, you know, being watched very closely by Turkey, who has done some of that in Syria, I would imagine, and other places, you know, they haven't been shy to be revisionist in the last 100 years of their history, uh, Turkey, that is. So, um uh, just the Ukraine situation and your thinking, how does that play uh, out? I think it's playing out quite significantly. Turkey has, has had a more nuanced foreign policy. It's trying to play both sides against the middle, not have any economic impact, actually have economic benefit as a result of the war and as a result of Western sanctions on Russia. And on the other hand, of course, trying to, to keep uh, a mediating position between the two parties. If he, I, I, I believe Turkey doesn't doesn't want um, Turkey would be would be happy to see the example of, of Russian revisionism win. Okay, because if if Russia actually succeeds in carving part of a larger part, because it already carved a part of Ukraine since 2014, just the West forgot about it. Okay, but if it succeeds to carve a much larger part of Ukraine. And despite the, the sanctions, despite the economic warfare and the energy warfare against Russia, and despite its, its attempt to basically throw it out of, throw the, the world's 11th largest economy out of the world of the global economy, if, if, even if Russia persists, perseveres, and succeeds in carving that part out, the example, the, the precedent that that sets is something which would be perceived positively by Erdogan. At the same time, I don't think Erdogan wants Russia to succeed too much, okay? Because he, that would create a, too too strong of a force in in the Black Sea that could uh, potentially turn against um, uh, turn against Turkey itself or drive a much harder bargain vis-a-vis -vis Turkey in all the other regional conflicts where Turkey, uh, from Libya to Syria to Nagorno-Karabakh, where basically Russia and Turkey are playing this give and take. Uh, quid pro quo balancing act between themselves, uh, which basically is not necessarily going always on, on uh, uh, to the benefit of Turkey. It's not always to the benefit of Turkey. It's a, it's a difficult position. I think that they tried to play somewhere between these two 
that would be the optimum position uh, for him. But it's, I think it's a very good example that the Greek government is trying to paint, and I think that should be done much more clearly and much more vocally paint with the same colors what Erdogan is trying to do in the Eastern Mediterranean and has been doing in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially since 2016, and what even his predecessors did in Cyprus back in 1973 with, with what Erdogan, with what, excuse me, Putin is doing in Ukraine and throughout the former Soviet Union, mind you, since much, much earlier, okay, since the first war with uh, with Georgia in 2008, and even before that, his predecessors did even before that. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're, you're very right. Uh, and we can really pick in history and find out, like, you know, the where that where that line is and how much of that is followed. And it wasn't like, you know, uh, that the West forgot about the Crimea. We just didn't even uh, pay attention to it. We just have de facto allowed it to take place, like Cyprus and other places like Syria. So uh, I think it's a point well taken. I just want to re remind everybody that you can put questions in the chat or you can put questions, raise your hand. And uh, so the aim here is to have a lively discussion among uh, people who are uh, on and participating. Um, uh, Isaac, do you have any questions for our guests? Or yeah, I do. I do actually. And, I mean, maybe it's a bit of an aside, but since you brought up Russia and Crimea, uh, sure. supposing Russia loses in Crimea, how do you see that affecting Turkey's in you, role in, in Crimea or Ukraine? Sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry. In 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 Ukraine. In Ukraine, terribly sorry. Supposing Russia loses in Ukraine, how would you see that affecting? Ankara's role in um, in the uh, Russian gas industry. Hmm. Well, I don't see any significant changes there. Tur Turkey wants. I think actually, Turkey is feel more empowered with, with regards to the energy trade game with Russia right now, uh, because it's it's the only major OECD country still consuming Russian gas and book, hooked with Russian gas on a long term basis because of its contracts. And what's going to happen, and that's not more importantly a change because of the war, but because of Turkish own gas discoveries, is that as Turkey becomes more self-sufficient in gas, and at the same time has uh, domestic market, has specific obligations to purchase Russian gas at volumes that Botas could no longer consume because it would have Turkish gas much cheaper within Turkey to be able to buy, that would create the possibility of excess gas export capacity in Turkey, which is Russian gas, essentially. That would need to find a way to go somewhere, okay? And uh, if that could be the European market, so that would basically undermine the efforts of the West and the US to read the region of, of, of Russia's gas continued influence, which is ending actually in Southeastern Europe by 2020, uh, um, 2026, the biggest contracts are with Greece, with the exception of Serbia. The biggest contracts are with Greece, and these are ending in 2026, the long-term contracts. But they could they could continue uh, through the masquerading of Russian gas exports as Turkish gas exports, and through the establishment of a, of a, of a hub for Russian gas in Turkey that Putin has announced with Erdogan and through their talks for several 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 months back. That's not by accident. The indexization means basically or a hub that the, the Russian gas that wouldn't have anywhere to go within Turkey could be exported to, to Europe, to Southeastern Europe as Turkish gas with a European price index, which would make it more competitive to any LNG cargo that we are shipping to Europe right now from the US, we're getting to Europe from now, from the US, from Qatar, or from, uh, from the Middle East. So that would play in this way with regards to gas. With regards to oil, I don't see any significant changes. With regards to nuclear power, it would be the, the opposite. I mean, Turkey would, would, would accelerate the completion of APU. It's doubtful whether she would have the first reactor in operation by the end of the year, which is the 100th anniversary of the of the of the Lausanne Treaty, by the way, and of the establishment of modern Turkey. Um, but um, we'll see how this how this would play out. Um, Turkey feels more empowered from the uh, destruction of, of of Russia's energy uh, markets in Europe because it gives it more leverage. And she will try to make the best of it by trying to, you know, to also become a, a major a supplier of, 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 of Southeastern Europe itself, but through 
becoming an even bigger transit for Russian gas to the markets of Southeastern and Central Europe. Um, of course, that remains to be seen how the general direction of the war would go, but I don't see Turkey weakening uh, because of that. Actually, uh, even if conditions remain as they are, or even even become worse for, for Russia, uh, Turkey's role would be further strengthened in that bilateral uh, negotiating uh, module that Erdogan and Putin have been doing between each other for the last 25 years, at least. 20 years, sorry. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, Thank yeah, you. So we have we have a question for you. Um, you know, uh, how may the uh, the earthquakes affect Turkey's economy and uh, hence its capabilities of following up on the revisionist foreign policy? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, it's still unclear what would be the effect to the economy. I've heard m figures of 100 billion, which is basically one eighth of Turkish GDP. Um, it's not clear how much is going to cost and what the effect is going to be on the Turkish economy. Uh, it's unclear whether the Turkish economy would need an IMF bailout to survive through that crisis, which for a Turkish Islamist, it's basically a poisonous pill for several reasons, because banks are associated with uh, uh, with uh, the power of, of, of Masons, of Jews, and uh, of the other, this conspiratorial belief that basically is, is, is everywhere to be found in the works of Erbakan and Kisakurek, and some of, of Erbakan's himself, of Erdogan's own rantings against Israel and against international Jewry, which starts after 2013, and the Gezi Park um, uh, protests, where he's trying to, to focus on, 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 on the Jews as, a, as, a, as an element of his anti-Semitic propaganda and his anti-Semitic perceptions. So if he, he, if he tries to do everything in his power to avoid an IMF bailout, which will remains to be seen, and what kind of conditions that bailout could impose on, 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 its, on Turkish foreign policy, this remains to be seen on whether he, he will become more or less aggressive. I think that to a very large extent, his position is going to be, uh, his tactical position is going, not his strategic position, strategic position is not going to change, but his tactical position may be, may force him to, you know, to reduce the tempo of his further expansion. Um, unless, of course, unless, of course, uh, there is uh, something in, in further which could be difficult to predict. So basically, I don't see a strategic change. We may, if Turkey becomes an IMF member, there would be a tactical change uh, with regards to what more he could claim over the next couple of years. But uh, other than that, um, a, a very important uh, parameter of the entire discussion would be of whether Turkey gets the F-16 jets or not. That is a very important component of how the Turkish behavior is going to, 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 to play out over the next few years. If Turkey gets the jets, uh, they will have the means and they will have the capability to become more and more uh, aggressive in the years to come and sustain the claims throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. If they don't get the jets and the balance of power, especially in the air, shifts in the favor of Greece, this may force them to be more, uh, to, to follow a less a less aggressive stand. So it's a strategic uh, decision that Congress, uh, because the position of the Greek the administration is very clear in this case, it's a very strategic decision that Congress will have to take uh, over the next few months. So uh, yeah, just a follow up, a quick follow up to that, and I, I welcome uh, Mr. Dennis to to our panel. Thank, uh, and I, I'm sure he has a question or two for you. Um, but my follow-up to that, then, you know, what stops Turkey from going to the the route that they've done in the past, not going to the IMF and go to Qatar or some other Gulf state and sort of like getting the money that they need? Uh, is that is that route closed for them, or is that a limitation of capacity on the part of Qatar and others to help them out within the Islamic world? It depends on how big it is, I mean, how big the bill is. If it is some, if it's a hundred billion. It's impossible to get it all from Qatar mm -hmm. uh, or from anywhere else. I don't see Saudi Arabia or the, the Emirates jumping in to help at this point. And if they do, they will also put their own geopolitical preconditions. So uh, 
that would be the the you know the, the the magic trick of the century if you can actually get a void again an IMF bailout that would be you know, because they have they have in the past within that within that framework right I mean like sure. in smaller chunks as you indicate but they have in the past sort of like you know been able to to avoid this uh, so it's almost like it's almost this other center that's being created outside of the the IMF World Bank Center you know that's very that's very accurate but again. The, 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 to answer that question, we need to be how big is the bill? How big is it? We don't know right now. If it's in the hundreds and hundreds of billions or more, I don't think that they will be able to get everything from Qatar or Saudi Arabia or the UAE. And if they do, uh, we'll see how, how it plays out. I'm sure that they're going to get some of it, but we don't know how big it is. If it's something that they, they, they if it's something more manageable, yes, they can pull it out again. Mm. And that's why they try to, to normalize the relationship with the Emirates and the Saudis in the first place. But uh, I, don't, I don't see them writing checks of 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 60 billion dollars uh, at this point. Without strings. Because, yes. Professor, uh, Professor uh, Chakiris, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful and um, educational um, uh, speech, comments, uh, and, and, and reporting. <clears throat> um, Thank you, sir. And this is uh, the, uh, the rebuilding of the, um, or the earthquake um, cal uh, calamity, is that uh, the money that uh, Erdogan or Turkey will be needing, right? The 100 billion, you mean? Yeah, maybe the, the money that uh, they uh, need to get it from somewhere where there's... Yes. Um, yeah, but also the, that, that, that's for the reconstruction, but also would be the negative effect to the, to the, to the economy by itself. You have 15 right, provinces. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but um, the, 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 uh, the biggest results or the biggest um, needs problems uh, is right now, obviously. The, um, and of course, this um, will impact um, both the, uh, the entire region of the uh, of the um, of migrants and and the um, effect of the earthquake and and so uh, already I believe um, Greece is um, trying to um, uh, to um, fortify their um, uh, the the, um, uh, the um, lines of uh, uh, and uh, and and the uh, new uh, uh, flex of um, of uh, migrants. Um, uh, the the part that I have, uh, uh, you know, all the, your the, your historical perspective is is appropriate and and, and uh, educational. But why is it the West and 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 we can blame the U.S. We can blame uh, um, some of the older uh, Western powers, but why is the West, including the entire uh, NATO countries? Um, really allow or condone the um, Erdogan's um, actions, policies, and uh, expansionism? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, um, I think that they haven't fully understood the type of, of, pol of political revolution that he brought to Turkey. Erdogan has been brilliant in trying to use the candidacy of, of Turkey in the European Union to destroy the checks and balances in his own power. He, the Takiye principle I used before as, as, a, as a tactic of, 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 uh, of uh, covering your real intentions, of masquerading your real intentions, is something that he used uh, in his long-term fight with the military and with the judiciary Kemalist classes within Turkey. So he has been very, very good in trying to masquerade and to, 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 uh, to, to fool his opponents, to uh, divert the attention of his opponents. And also because still Turkey is a member of NATO. So the fact, even though it's, it's a member of NATO, which has a transactional relationship with NATO in the United States, and we're seeing that right now more than clearly with the Turkish position with regards vis-a-vis -vis Finland and Sweden on Turkey's on, on their accession to an admission to NATO, even now, even now, it's used to such an extent that it, it obfuscates the reality. 
that basically Turkey is a transactional ally of NATO, that is, it cannot be considered as an ally to the West because it has its own agenda, and his own agenda is to rise, and that's part of, of, the, of the geopolitical program of Kisakyurek, of Erbakan, of Erdogan, and of Turkish Islamists, is that if Turkey is allowed to reconstitute the Ottoman uh, region uh, or regional influence. But, yeah, professor, to... I, professor, I understand fully and, and agree with your premise and, uh, and, and Erdogan's uh, dreams and, and uh, power seeking position. However, I mean, I was looking at a picture of, um, of uh, the US president uh, recently, and um, it was like he was seeing uh, some um, uh, dream uh, with his smile and Erdogan is looking at him in a serious kind of a um, of an of a of a of a look. Um, he's a member of NATO, but he's also courting and wants to buy uh, the um, uh, missiles from uh, from Russia. Um, and, and he's threatened another member. So my point on that is really, what can the academia, what can uh, Professor Van Bakas Institute do to awaken some of the European members of NATO to really demand and put uh, Erdogan out of NATO, including the latest uh, situation that demands for the um, new countries uh, want to get into the um, NATO, even though I have a lot other questions and other issues with NATO expansionism as well. Um, so what can we do? Uh, you know, it's a very important, you're a professor, uh, Bamba, uh, Professor Bambakas, uh, the same, and I'm a student and I'm, I'm looking at, at, and I'm hearing your whole uh, premises uh, and, and history, and I want to do something. I'm I'm, I feel sort of um, hopeless as a student. What is my future? How can I change the future of the world? And what's the citizens vis-a-vis -vis, um, democracy and, and, uh, and, and policies uh, of, of the government can do and, and change? Well, uh, thank you very much for that. I if you would allow me, uh, Professor Mavakas, it would be the last question to take because I have to also a class and students uh, I have to return to if, okay. if you would allow me. Um, yeah. Well, that's that's a very, very interesting uh, question. The impact of democracy in terms of foreign policy formation varies between de depending on the different political systems. I think that the US example is one of the very few examples that a power which is so great, which is the preeminent power of the international system, has the, ha, um, is influenced to the extent it is influenced through uh, public opinion as expressed by Congress. No other Congress in empires apart from the Roman Republic had that level of influence in terms of foreign policy. So I believe that uh, in cases such as the United States, public opinion, uh, the democratic institutions, the, 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 the constant um, education of congressional leaders with regards to what's happening in the region and their awakening to, to what's actually happening in the region is the best way that we can have, we can, we can affect a significant difference in terms of pressure to the orthodoxy of, of, of American foreign policy, which sees Turkey as the uh, irreplaceable ally, okay? And the idea is that if, if we, we try to do something that would further estrange Turkey from us, that she would fall into the arms of Russia or to the arms of China or to the arms of the, I don't know, the, the Ku Klux Klan, I don't, I don't care. I, I mean, we'll try to find, <laughs> in the sense, a, a, another foreign entity to do that. The, that I, is yes, a premise to foreign I, policy. Excuse I, me. I, I if, agree if I, totally, if, and uh, I absolutely, absolutely, uh, this is why uh, both Professor Mavakas and I have been talking and, and, and working together uh, in these um, citizen and democracy crossroads. Um, and, uh, and I believe, sir, if, if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that what has happened in Congress over the last years since Katza and since the East Med Act 
is indicative of, of the efficacy of such uh, efforts yeah. within a functioning republic such as the United States. Uh, I hope I hope we could actually see the same in, in Europe. I, I hope have, that the uh, European Union, to which Greece and Cyprus is part of, would do the same correct. that the U.S. Congress the, the did. The part that's very important, I want to, in my background, is that back in the um, 70s and 80s, um, and the Dukakis uh, rise to uh, getting the Democratic, Democratic nomination, I was very, very close in, in working with recipients in the United States, um, all over the, 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 the United States. And um, in fact, um, we worked before, uh, during the 74, invasion uh, with um, uh, the then um, uh, Governor Carter and he, he uh, was able to get elected uh, and then he promised us uh, that he was going to do something he didn't so we uh, really uh, and I'm writing a book to that effect um, uh, that uh, I was very involved in uh, much uh, more um, understanding the in fact probably uh, uh, you probably were not born uh, you know, just about you were young uh, young uh, gentlemen, 77, uh, sir. 1977, yeah. sir. So I right, know. right. There you are. So I, I, okay. I you know, I have been uh, in historical perspective. I've followed and and, and worked very diligently uh, and promoted um, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy to uh, over uh, over uh, power or to take the nomination out of uh, President Carter um, and so forth. So uh, you I may read it in my book um, sometime soon. Looking forward to it. Thank uh, you, sir. I know. I know you have to. Uh, I know you have to. You have to run. You left. Sorry. Us with Sorry. A, the sign of a good of a good presentation is you left us with a lot more questions than we had. Uh, <laughs> going, thank you. In, I'll try. Which is which is you know a bravo thank you, to sir. you and thank you to Mr. Dennis and everybody else that put this together. Uh, I do think I see a, a new theme arising of this issue of like uh, interest versus values. Uh, and maybe that will be an ongoing conversation. Again, thank you very much. And I do appreciate you. your tight schedule. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.